Welcome, everybody. So this is the Budget Advisory Commission. Today is uh, Thursday, December 8th, uh, 2022. Um, just yes, that is correct. <laughs> um, and uh, this will be our last regular meeting of the year. So welcome, everybody. We'll call the meeting to order. Um, and I will start with the land acknowledgement, then we'll go through roll call and approval of the agenda. So welcome, everybody. Um, so a land acknowledgement is a formal statement that recognizes and respects indigenous peoples and the enduring relationship that exists between indigenous peoples and the land. I'd like to acknowledge that we live and work on the unceded land of the Dena'ina people and thank them for the past, present and future stewardship of the land on which we all live. <coughs> and just another note, especially for our folks on teens, um, just a reminder that we're doing a hybrid meeting. So we're in person here in um, City Hall and also online with, uh, with a virtual meeting. So the Teams chat is not part of the audio recording of this meeting. Um, to make the audio record as complete as possible, comments should be stated in the record verbally and not placed in the chat. If you make a comment in the chat, um, I will ask you to state the comment in the record. And of course, as, as we always do, um, please feel free to use the chat if you want to um, ask a question or just get in the queue and I will uh, keep an eye on it. So if, and if you do make a statement, I'll just ask you to say it out loud. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Lila for welcome. Roll call. Thank you. Ms. Brown? Here. Mr. Flynn? <laughs> Mr. Flynn? Mr. Flynn? Here. Ms. Hall? Ms. Hall? Here. Here. Ms. Hobson? Here. Mr. Plowden? Here. Ms. Reese? Here. Mr. Tamani? Ms. Warfield? Present. Thank you. Okay, sounds like we have a quorum. Um, so welcome everybody and thanks for joining. Um, next we'll do approval of the agenda. Um, so if I could have a motion and a second to approve and take a moment to look. This is Carmela Warfield. Move to approve the agenda for December 8th, 2022. Okay, um, can I have a second? This is Carolyn, I'll second. Okay, motion by Carmela, second by Carolyn. Um, is there any changes or additions to the agenda? Okay, uh, not hearing any, is there any objection to approval? Okay, great, we will consider the agenda approved. Um, so next we'll move on to uh, informational reports. Um, so for the chair's report, as we said, um, it's the last uh, regular meeting of the year. And I believe everything else um, is uh, going to be covered on the, the rest of the agenda. So uh, then we'll move to assembly report. I see we have our assembly member Forrest Dunbar, so go ahead. Thank you. Um, hopefully everybody can hear me. Um, so this will be my uh, my final report to the Budget Advisory Commission, probably ever. Uh, I've been coming here a number of years. Um, so uh, of course, everyone here knows we passed the budget on the 22nd. Um, the the assembly made a number of amendments. The two largest were the restoration of the mobile crisis team or the mental health first responders program. And we added about $1.5 million to snow removal. This was three weeks ago, mind you, so, or two weeks ago. So um, hopefully that will uh, will allow for at least one more additional full haul out. Um, the mayor made three vetoes. Um, it was more than that because there were sort of different lines, but essentially there were three things that he vetoed. Funding for the Brother Francis shelter to keep them at 120 beds, um, technical assistance for nonprofits that want to access the alcohol tax funds for, I think, particularly for um, child abuse and sexual assault prevention, um, and then a security contract for the assembly chambers. Um, the assembly overrode the mayor's veto on Bro Brother Francis shelter. And then we we didn't technically override the veto on the technical assistance for nonprofits, but we effectively did. We let the veto stand, and then we passed the exactly equivalent resolution that that provided those funds, um, but basically to a different department because there had been some uh, some separation of powers concerns that the legal department had had expressed along with that veto. And then we allowed the uh, the I think it was a forty thousand dollar cut to the assembly security contract. We allowed that to stand. <clears throat> so with that. We have uh, sort of wrapped up this stage of the uh, of the budget process. Um, I will say that 
There were a couple of additions to the bond uh, that were put forward and passed by the assembly during the um, on the 22nd, and the mayor did not veto those. Um, but all the bonds, of course, come back to the assembly in January because the second meeting of January is when we actually put them on the ballot. So that's an opportunity both for the assembly to add more projects um, and uh, potentially for the mayor again to veto them. Um, so with that, that's the end. I'll say um, I'll be resigning from the assembly in either late December, late December, or early January. I'm working out the timing with the uh, with the uh, clerk's office um, so that uh, a, a East Anchorage assembly member can be an interim assembly member can be hopefully seated the first meeting of January. Um, and then my my co-chair of of budget and finance, Ms. Quinn Davidson, will hopefully take over this role. And I don't know yet if the chair is going to appoint a second, a, a new co-chair of budget and finance. So with that, I'm, I'm open to take any questions you guys might have on that or anything else. Thank you. Um, are there any questions? Oh, yeah, it looks like Caroline, you have your hand up. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, question about the third veto. Why allow that stand when it came to security detail in the chambers? Thank you. The the administration presented evidence that I. Uh, so they didn't veto the whole thing. He vetoed like two thirds of it and they had this contract and they said we think we can get this cheaper. Um, and frankly, it wasn't something I was um, intimately involved with. It was a, sort of a a leadership priority for the uh, chair and vice chair, Ms. Uh, LaFrance and Mr. Constant. And so Ms. Quinn Davidson and I sort of left that to them. And on the night of, I guess that was two nights ago, that I'm, I'm in the right day right now, um, two nights ago, the, the, assembly, the chair just didn't bring a motion to override the veto. So I, I'm not sure exactly why. Maybe they agreed with the mayor's math or maybe for some other reason they decided not to. But there still is some money in there, I think 20,000 out of 60,000 to provide that security. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for your time um, helping us out on this body. Much appreciated and best of luck to you. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, any other questions? Okay, uh, I don't see any in the chat and I don't see any folks raising their hands. So, um, so I'll echo what Carolyn said and thank you for your um, service on the assembly and coming. Hey. Oh, oh, sorry, <laughs> something else. Um, Question? Oh. No, I think it was just a. a oh, okay. Little, um, I'm going to ask to be excused. Okay. That's okay. And um, I still will be on the assembly until, like I said, probably early January. So if you guys have a question, please send me an email and um, I might pass some of them off to Austin. Uh, but uh, I'll do everything I can to continue supporting you guys in my last few weeks. I really appreciate the work that the Budget Advisory Commission does. And you're one of our, our sort of busiest um, and most impactful commissions. Um, and so I uh, thank you for volunteering to serve Ms. Pavi of Anchorage. Thanks, okay, uh, so then next we'll move on to the uh, school district report. And I see we have, um, I believe we have our school board member, Kelly Lessons, as well as um, Andy Ratlin from the administration. So um, I guess I'll ask uh, whoever would like to go first. <laughs> Kelly, I think I caught you off guard last month. But either way is fine. Um, I, I'll go first as long as here, I'll turn on my camera. Um, I want to say that uh, our administration has been working very, very hard to keep the board abreast of a lot of information and some of it has been changing. Um, but I sincerely appreciate their efforts and I really appreciate um, community members participation in well, quite frankly, it was a really hard, like emotionally challenging month of November with, um, I think we had nine total town halls regarding the school closures, six were in person, and school closures and repurposing, six were in person, then there were three virtual. And um, from my perspective, it was just really emotionally challenging. Um, there's a lot at stake for a lot of folks at front with a massive structural deficit. Um, yesterday, the board had a finance committee meeting, and so some of my thoughts really are coming from that as well as from Monday's work session and board meeting. Um, the administration presented a pro forma um, presentation 
uh, sort of giving us advance notice of where they're at with the budget. And I think before we even begin, the structural deficit of this flat base student allocation really amounts to more than $80 million for next fiscal year. However, the board has been able to save $16 million in one-time funds. So that brought that number down to the $68 million that folks are maybe most familiar with. And then in the revised, uh, in the pro forma, the administration revised that $68 million figure down to $48 million. And so there's about $19 million in savings, essentially, that are coming from increased revenues, um, decreased expenses, uh, courtesy of um, like personnel vacancies and the municipality shouldering the SRO costs, um, and also the rollover of remaining unspent federal funds. Um, so 68, sorry, more than 80 million, down to 68, down again to 48, and then the administration notified the board that there will be up to about $28 million um, in essentially our savings account in the fund balance. And uh, Andy can correct me if I'm wrong on this, um, but really that that is a sizable amount and it's available because quite frankly, we don't have the purchasing power to pay our people enough to attract and retain them. We have more than 400 vacancies across the district. So those savings that we can, the bright side is that we can apply those savings to next year, uh, but they're really coming at the expense of class sizes this year. And I was looking at the very back of our pro forma and there's a chart. Um, and I was looking at one item in particular, which is PTR. And that is our pupil to teacher ratio. And this year, uh, that chart is showing that our PTR, the average PTR is 32.2. That's up by five from last year. And that doesn't account for the, the, uh, the school board has applied federal funds to maintain levels of PTR at a flat level, a status quo level, like we've backfilled our budget. But the reality is that our class sizes have dramatically increased because we don't have the people that we need to keep the class sizes at the size that we need. Um, Member Donley asked a great question at our Monday work session, and we followed up with that a little bit in yesterday's finance meeting. And well, you know, what is the what does the structural deficit look like for FY25? Right, we've been talking about FY24. Well, if nothing changes from Juno, we received a 90 to 95 million dollar deficit estimate for FY25. So it is imperative that the community comes together and really that the Anchorage caucus, no matter what what part of the city they represent, no matter their political position, um, we need them to go to bat for Anchorage students um, so so that we can pursue, um, you know, both efficiencies and and also just not devastate public education. We have we spent hours on Monday listening to um, people who care deeply about swimming and ignite. And um, we've heard from, um, you know, immersion families. Uh, there are beloved and highly effective programs and opportunities, and those are very much at risk if we can't balance our budget. Um, so I just I wanted to leave with one other thought uh, regarding the, the swimming input that we received. And I don't know if this is the appropriate venue, but you all are here. We received testimony suggesting that the school district is being charged as much as three and a half times as our as club sports are for pool usage. And so some folks have said that ASD is being charged almost $200,000 a year when you divided up the per lane costs, um, whereas club sports might be charged about 58,000 for the same kinds of usage. So I think that's something that um, either ASD's contract department or folks at the municipality might need to look at. And I, I'm not saying that to want to raise prices for club sports, but I am trying to relay uh, some interesting information that folks have, have shared with the board. So I'll pause right there. And maybe I'll just let Andy speak. Yeah, thank you. Go ahead, Andy. Um, yeah, thank you. I just uh, wanted to provide a little bit more context on, you know, Ms. Lesson, she Yep, sound like I got most of those numbers right. So the context of going from the 68 million down to about 48 million. Uh, when we first did our projection back in July to kind of get a rough estimate of what our deficit was going to be, it was really 
based on current years, projected enrollment. We didn't have the enrollment for the current school year yet, how many kids actually came back. And then we just applied rough 2% inflation to all costs. Um, so kind of the big differences between that 68 million and the 48 million were um, in a few big categories. Like there was a little bit over $3 million or so in uh, new revenue, predominantly from uh, more having more students with intensive needs and more correspondent students. So we had $3 million in new revenue. Um, we backed out the cost of the SROs, which we had uh, previously budgeted for, but the assembly and then the mayor, they picked that up in that budget, so we were able to take it out. Um, there was a one-time payment for our teachers, a bonus payment in the FY23 contract, in their contract that goes away for next year. It's another two and a half million. And then we just increased our estimates for how many vacancies we were going to have based on our current trends. So that was another couple million of that. So that's about 10 million in between new revenue and decreased expenses that gets from 68 million down to about uh, 57 or 58, 57 million. And then we have about $10 million or so of additional uh, ESER stimulus money that we're with that's going to remain unspent this year that we can carry over. So it's another one time funding source that's going to help offset that deficit next year. And that's largely, as Ms. Lesson said, you know, we have all these vacancies and that's exp extending to our grant funds as well. So we just can't not provide, not being able to provide the services that we had planned on. Um, but those are the big issues, um, and then we will have some fund balance up to 28 million or so with uh, if we pull the fund balance down to the board minimum that uh, they carry. And the way they calculate it, it's, it's on a percentage of expenditures, so our undesignated fund balance or savings uh, as a percentage of what our total expenditures are. Um, Typically, the states had a 10% cap, and we've always been at that 10% cap. However, that was waived, so we're able to go over it this year. But um, so each percentage is about 6 million. So the difference between that 10% cap and the 8% minimum, um, about a $12 million swing there. So if this board wanted to stay at the 10% cap, it would be about 16 million they could use. But if they want to go down to the 8% minimum, about 28 million. Um, but with that, you know, I think uh, Ms. Lesson's really summed it up pretty well. So uh, if you have any questions, I think we can open it up. Okay, um, thank you to you both. Um, are there folks uh, with questions? So please just raise your hand or. Okay, I'm not seeing any so far. I guess one question I have. Um, Kelly, just to follow up on the, the pool um, spending. So that's, is that, because um, I know, for example, I believe West High has a pool. So is that um, used by school programs of pools and school facilities, or is it also other facilities? What does that look like? Oh, there you're on mute. There, is that better? Um, yeah, no. So this is not something I'm intimately familiar with. Again, this is coming from folks who are deeply enmeshed in the SLIM community who have shared emails, you know, really outlining that um, the, AS, the ASD is getting charged for, for example, $510 a day for two hours at Diamond or at Chugiak um, or at Bartlett um, and Eagle River, a little bit higher at service because both South and service use the pool, so they use it for longer. Um, but uh, the private programs might only be charged $144 for those two hours. Um, they provided folks, and I, I can forward this email as well. Um, you know, so they provided daily totals, season totals, and calculated that ASD is spending um, $196,000 for pool rent for practice when the municipality would charge the same space and use of time to other users about $58,000. So, you know, if that's true, I think that's really concerning, um, but this is out of my league. Um, so I just, I wanted to raise that to this commission's attention um, to consider exploring uh, whether all users are being charged fairly. Is that helpful? 
Yeah, thanks, Kelly. And I, and I appreciate this isn't that's not your <laughs> your area of expertise, but um, but yeah, that's interesting. And, uh, and sorry, yeah, yeah. Um, and actually, uh, because we have our Parks and Recreation Department here for a different purpose, we actually do have the subject matter experts in the room with us. And so I think they might be able to shed some light on this particular um, topic since we are the ones that kind of manage those pools. Sure. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, and if you don't mind introducing. Sure. My name is Mike Braniff. I'm the director of Parks and Recreation with the municipality. And uh, with the question posed to us earlier this week, um, or I went about uh, working with the aquatic staff to understand better the fee structure uh, that's applied to both the school district and uh, and the swim clubs, the private swim clubs. And we will have a, an answer that we will put out for you all. But what we've discovered is a number of different factors contribute to the difference in the rates. And the first is school district requires two lifeguards to be on duty at all times while the swim team has the pool. Uh, for the club swim, it only requires one, I believe, if there's under 25 kids in the pool. Um, the second is the school district requires exclusive use of the pool and the swim clubs uh, don't, and from what I understand, in some instances, don't use the entire pool. Um, the, I'm going to forget a couple of these, you can help me out. But I know another one is that some of the swim clubs have taken on the cleaning and even some of the maintenance of the facility. And all of those three factors, and perhaps one more. I don't forget to this is uh, Shanna Gamble. I'm the principal admin. So the other factor too with the ASD is um, we provide discounts to um, the migrant ed, um, the special ed, and like elementary and other ASD affiliated programs. Um, so like if an elementary school wanted to come in, they would get a discounted rate. So it was kind of all put together. Um, and this fee was put together back in 2015. So it's been, you know, in effect for quite a while. And if anything, all fees really should be increased across the board. Um, we haven't raised our fees in over 10 years. So, um, so yeah, the, like Mike said, it's really that ASD gets exclusive use to the pool wall. Um, if a swim team is in there, we can still do other programming. We can rent other lands out, we can have, our own swim lessons. So there's an extra set of revenue coming in. Okay. I, I appreciate that. Um, Mike and, and Shanna, is there a way that you can notify the school board of, you know, whatever sort of summary that you're working on? Would you be able to email that to us? Because we have been receiving a lot of questions. Yeah, we'll be providing a response. The question had made it to us through an assembly member, and that's how we happen to be working on it. Uh, but we will provide a response to the school board. Great. You can just email us at schoolboard at asdk12.org. Okay. Thank you so yeah. much. Yeah, I'm glad that, that worked out. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and I know, obviously, you know, even even if you change the school the swim rates, that's not going to solve the budget crisis, right? But, right. Um, yeah. But that's helpful to know. Yeah. So, um, so any other questions um, for our school board and, and school district folks? Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I, I know that um, you know the legislative session hasn't kicked off yet, but it does this is the school district um, has the school district formulated a really precise ask of the of the legislature as far as as far as the um, updating of the BSA like to us is it and is it to a certain dollar amount fixed dollar amount or to a some kind of inflation adjusted type of formula or, or what's what's kind of on the table great question um we we just had our legislative luncheon last week and the board unveiled its legislative priorities which boil down to the three b's uh, a base student allocation and there's a whole bunch of bullet points under that uh, busing because transportation funding from the state has been flat even longer than the base student allocation and um, BSA busing and bond. Oh, state school bond debt reimbursement, um, which there's been a moratorium now for seven or eight years. Um, so those are the three B's. I'm happy to figure out where I can provide a link here. Um, 
I will say that the specific amount that I, the gap between the numbers that um, our, our finance team has shared and what we will be receiving is $860 per student for FY24. And uh, actually within our pro forma, I was looking at this the other day, it showed that we will receive, because next school year, there's gonna be a $30 per student BSA increase, uh, which is the first one since um, this year's sixth graders uh, were kindergartners. Um, but that $30 increase will amount to like $2.6 million or so in additional revenue for ASD. So, so the real need for next year is $860. Uh, per student. Um, and I will provide a link here in just a minute for the, um, I know that there's a, a summary of all of our uh, legislative priorities. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Kelly. And if you can put it in the, the chat or just email it to Lila, she can send it out to everybody. Okay, uh, any other questions? Okay, uh, well, I'm not seeing any um, in the chat. So again, thank you for, for being here um, and thank you for giving your report and um, yeah, have a happy holiday and end of the last uh, part of the year. Thanks all, bye-bye. All right, bye everyone. Okay, uh, so let's move on to our uh, OMB reports. We've got a couple things under there. So go ahead, Courtney. Um, so the first one is the uh, budget versus actuals, and this is through uh, the end of November. Um, and so as we report the 5% over and under, you'll notice that um, the majority of departments are under. And for some of those, that is going to remain the case. Um, I think it's kind of a, a well-known thing, and I don't think we're the only ones that are experiencing it, uh, but vacancies and having a hard time filling positions. Um, we have a significant amount of uh, vacancies in specific departments. So APD in total is uh, close to 60 positions vacant um, for, in this, with all this nice fluffy white stuff outside, um, everyone will probably be happy to hear this, but we are short um, equipment operators in our street maintenance departments. Um, they're down some permanent positions, but also the seasonal positions. Um, there's uh, multiple factors that are going into that and we are working um, directly with the department and with the union um, that represents that group of individuals on how we can address um, getting some of those positions filled and uh, retaining some um, employees in those. So we do have some significant vacancies um, all across. Uh, AHD is another one. I think they're up around 27 positions vacant. Um, so a lot of that contributes to these departments that are going to be under. Uh, currently, right now, we have two departments, and they're not reflected in this right now, um, that are projected to be over at the end of the year, and that is a um, FD, so the fire department, and public transportation are both projecting to go over budget um, by the end of the year. Right now, the fire department um, is maintaining a projection of about $1.1 million dollars. Um, over their budget and public transportation is around 950,000. Um, and for public transportation, uh, there is theirs are the majority due to the fuel increase um, and the fact that we're continuing to uh, maintain our bus routes um, and not change that service. Um, they are another department that are seeing significant vacancies though. So the ability to offset that a little bit is, is kind of keeping that number a little lower than it uh, otherwise would be. So right now that is um, the budget to actuals for through November. Um, and then uh, we'll see how kind of the year plays out and what we'll do at the end of the year is for those departments that go over budget. Um, you know, we, we do have to go through for an appropriation because uh, legally, we have to have a balanced budget. Um, so that is where we are so far for 2022. If there are any questions. Okay, thanks, Courtney. Um, I will, so uh, folks raise your hand and then I'm going to ask a question. Um, mm -hmm. Looking, I was just curious about, I see number 29 there, the convention center is at 43%. And I just wondered, um, is that like is that just having less events or what's the no so the convention centers is actually um the 
codified requirement for the Denina Center, I believe the Sullivan Arena, the PAC. Um, and so we actually, that's kind of when we talk about the Rome tax, if the part of that is the third, the th you know, that we break it up into the thirds. Um, and so right now we're not continuing to utilize, you know, the Sullivan Arena um, in that fashion. Um, and so I would have to look into it a little bit more, but but yes, that's basically is that we don't have an operator for that facility at this time. And then there was a gap in the operator for um, the Dempsey and Ben Bohe. And I believe those are in that um, group as well. So it says convention center, but it should have an S on it because it's multiple. Yeah. Oh, okay. So yeah, I was just thinking of the Denina and Egan. Yeah. Makes sense. Okay. Yep. Okay. Uh, any other questions on the budget to actuals? Okay, I, I don't see any right now, so why don't we move on and then we can come back to this one that comes up later. Sure, yep. Um, so we'll go into the budget recap um, and I'll just uh, touch on some things. Um, I saved in the 23 folder the mayor's vetoes. If you can pull it up, it's the PDF. Um, so the 2023 um, capital and operating budgets were approved on November 22nd. Um, as part of the capital, the assembly. Uh, mayor's vetoes. Yep. Yeah. Um, and so the assembly added um, roughly $3.6 million of amendments. Um, to the 2023 operating above it, budget above what the administration, the mayor's proposed budget was. Um, that still brings us currently, um, and again, this is something you know that gets addressed in first quarter when we um, true up the tax cap limitation um, and review all of our revenues. But currently, we are uh, roughly 1.25 million under the uh, estimated tax cap. Um, with those amendments. Um, the mayor did propose some vetoes and Lila has them up on the screen. Um, and so as we went through the, the line items, as you'll notice, um, and Assembly Member Dunbar uh, touched on it, but the $150,000 for the technical assistance, um, there was a separation of powers issues um, identified by the Department of Law. Um, and is lined out in this document. This is also available on the agenda from the last meeting of December 6th. Um, scroll down, we'll just keep going. Yep. Um, and so that you you can see and keep going. Although, yep, keep going. <laughs> this is all the legal. This is all the legal opinion um, on the separation of powers. The next line item was the veto of the brother Francis um, line item for the sheltering both the 445,000 and the 730. And again, you can see is that um, the terms that were identified in the amendment um, have it identified that they were going to permanently increase their capacity. And there was some ambiguity in the fact that they're saying they can't when the capacity increased um, was another question of debate. Um, and so uh, based on the fact that this, the amendment specifically said increased capacity, uh, Brother Francis has identified they're going to stay at 120. So, uh, you know, I, I'm I'm not sure how how all well that um, will play out, but they did override those two lines. Um, go down, and then this is the security contract. Um, so you'll notice that the forty-four thousand dollars is what was vetoed by the mayor, um, and that was done because again, identifying separation of powers issues, the amount. Um, based on our Securitas, who has the contract um, for security at assembly meetings. Um, that amount for assembly meetings is $20,928. Um, and so what the mayor did was leave that amount in for the assembly and then vetoed the remaining amount, um, which will continue to be used for other security um, needs throughout the facilities in the municipality. And so that includes the building at AHD, um, this building here at City Hall, the library for all other open hours, the rest of the library branches um, all have security needs as well as Bernard Rec Center um, and Fairview Rec Center. So those funds will continue to be used um, at all of those facilities. And then the remaining lines is just the revenue lines um, corresponding to the, the previous vetoes. So 
So those are the vetoes and as uh, assembly member Dunbar um, explained, the only items that were actually overrode were those related to the brother Francis shelter. Um, and so that that goes into the 2023 budget um, and those figures are then applied and start January 1st um, available to departments to utilize. On the capital side, um, the assembly added six amendments um, to the capital budget um, totaling $3 million. Uh, there were three projects for project management and engineering and road projects. There was one project for Parks and Rec, um, and then there were two projects for the fire department. Uh, and so at this point, uh, the mayor did not veto any of those. However, we are putting together our um, proposition language, and those ordinances will go in front of the assembly, um, well, I think to make the timing of the uh, mail-in ballots, they have to be to the assembly by January. So that is where we are. Okay, thank you, Brittany. Yep. Um, are there any other questions? I don't see any, I guess maybe one just as a general reminder. So I know there's um, what they call first quarter budget revisions. Maybe you could just talk for a minute about what that looks like and how it impacts, um, I guess, this, whatever we don't spend this year <laughs> and then uh, looking at next year. Um, so what happens after the, this year closes, our fiscal year runs um, through the calendar year. So we're at January 1 to December 31st. So at December 31st, the finance department will start evaluating um, the revenues, the actual revenues and actual expenses that were done. And what they do is evaluate all of the funds and then determine um, any fund balance um, that may or may not exist. So if we have a fund balance, then um, the decision to either use that to offset um, our taxing ability or to utilize that in making up our, we have a a 10% and a 2% requirement um, in order to try to maintain our bond rating. Um, and so we can keep that in our fund balance and utilize that um, in order to maintain that. If we have a deficit, what that does is then that goes into our calculations in our taxing capacity in order to make up, um, to keep that 10 and 2% um, so that we, we hopefully can try to maintain um, the bond rating agency or bond rating um, as we have seen a decline in our rating um, over the last uh, couple of years. So um, the the higher that rating, or I should say the lower that rating goes, the higher our interest rates are. Um, so we want to try to maintain that. But once we have those figures, what we do is we true up um, the budget one more time. And so what we go through is we anything that we kind of made assumptions on as far as personnel, union contracts, um, expenses that we might have um, just kind of, you know, had a, a CPI escalator on that made an assumption. We'll go in and we'll true up all of those factors. And then we use the actual factors in calculating the tax cap calculation. Um, so that has a population um, component to it as, long as, as well as a CPI component. Um, and so once those figures are known, we go in and we true up the tax cap calculation as well. And so we have the figure of what we truly are allowed to um, utilize in the in taxing capacity. Um, and then as well as the, the true up uh, expenses that we expect to have, and then we'll um, balance out again and see where we are. And then uh, policy decisions from there, as far as if we, um, if we're over the expected tax cap calculation at that time or under, um, we go through that full process in uh, February, March, and then in April, we present what is called the revised budget um, to the assembly. And when that is passed, the mill rates are set at that same time. There's another document that goes to the assembly that sets the mill rates, and those are used um, to determine what the property taxes will be for the current year. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a good reminder that I know the, the fall budget process gets the most attention, but that it really is a year-round. Are there several points in the year that you guys are busy? So yes, yeah, yeah. not to mention the management parts. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
Okay, any other uh, questions for OMB? I'm not seeing any online. Um, okay, so thank you for the report. Yep. Uh, one other thing is the legislative program uh, was also on the agenda for the meeting on Tuesday. Um, if anyone is interested in going and seeing that, uh, it is on the agenda and it's a pretty robust um, document that was uh, presented uh, that includes a lot of a lot of different asks and a lot of different perspectives. So uh, we have some statutory requests from the Department of Law included in that, as well as um, you know the port and funding. Um, operational programs and and things like that so um, that is also available yeah thanks for pointing that out yep. and was that um is that something that the assembly voted to approve yet or was it just yeah no they okay. voted on it on tuesday okay yep um okay well, maybe that's a good topic for january just to go over that in a little more detail yeah um and maybe the school one as well we can follow up so. um okay well with that why don't we move on and i'm actually going to suggest that we I should have thought of this that we swap six and seven because we do have a couple guests here, so I don't want to hold them <laughs> through all the rest of our meeting. Um, so if there's no objection, I'm going to propose we change uh, the order just to move up the Parks and Rec presentation. I'm just going to go with it. Um, so there's no objection. So um, yeah, so I'm going to turn it over to uh, Mike and Shannon, our guests from Parks and Rec, and um, this was just a to have a little bit of a, a light topic uh, in this holiday season so that we could hear uh, a little bit more about what you guys do in terms of um, holiday lighting, decoration, those kinds of activities. Um, and then I did have to tie it back to the budget, but um, don't feel too tight in that. So <laughs> go ahead. Okay. Yeah. What's well, nice to be able to talk about something fun and yeah. uh, the lights. Um, so we, let's see, I'll just start with the, uh, the budget for it or the money we on average spend annually, and then the labor hours to go into it. So this year we spent about $2,500 on Christmas lights, trees, and a couple other decorations. And that's a pretty typical annual average that we spend on the decorations. Horticulture is the department that does all the Christmas lights that we see in town square, in, uh, here at City Hall, in uh, Cuddy Family Midtown Park. Um, and they, although we don't track this separately because it, it really is incorporated into the work they already do with the other aspects of the greenhouse, we spend, I would estimate on average about 300 labor hours per year on, uh, putting the lights up, maintaining them, taking them down, storing them, uh, all of that. Um, in addition to that, uh, we always like to have an opportunity to give a special thanks to, uh, Chugach Electric. They provide the bucket trucks to install the lights in the trees in Town Square, as well as Cuddy Family Midtown Park. And then we always would like to thank the Cuddy family as well, because they pay for the, the tree at, uh, at Midtown Park. And that's the that's a one of a kind. That's the only instance of uh, basically a private entity paying for, for some of this. Um, we also place Christmas trees indoors at uh, a few municipal locations where they're viewed by a fair amount of the public. Um, we do, oh, I'd have to add them up, but 10 or 12 locations or so, like the Permit Center here at City Hall, um, a number of places, uh, yeah, to decorate it for the holidays. And then the one final component uh, that's fun for us is we grow poinsettias. We grow about 300 per year. Um, if you come in City Hall right now, you see them all over. Yeah, 300. Yeah, well, they go to all sorts of different facilities. And, uh, so we go 300 or so. We get tiny little poinsettias all stuffed in a box uh, in June each year. And really, that gets incorporated into our, our greenhouse operations. Uh, and just it slides right in. And we spend about $800 a year on the poinsettias. And I don't know what the labor hours would be with that, but they stop through and maintain them each day. So. I don't know, all told, we're spending maybe $3,500 a year on lights and, uh, oh, I don't know, three or 400 labor hours. But uh, yeah, it's something that uh, everybody associates with Parks and Rec and feels positive about, so. Sure. Yeah, yeah actually, I, I have to comment, I'm surprised it's so low. I would have thought it would be more, but I guess maybe there's uh, things you use year to year, it sounds like. Yeah, I think, 
I don't know what to guess exactly, but I might guess that we get five years out of Christmas lights, and we're sort of just rotating through replacing inventory. You know, we're storing them, we store them indoors, they go up, they come down every year, they don't get left out, but it's really just replacing, you know, lights that, uh, that stop working. And, yeah. so. Oh, and one more plug, uh, the, the last location that we light is the Man Lyser Memorial Greenhouse, which is our greenhouse in Russian Jack. And we do a big light display there, but we're always bragging about and inviting members of the public to come see the tropical house, solarium, uh, a really unique place that, especially in winter, I think when you come in, it's like you're walking into a tropical rainforest and you're seeing 50 and 60 year old trees from uh, tropical locations and you're really just stepping into a, another world. It's totally free. It's available to the public. Um, yeah, everybody should uh, yeah, stop in if they haven't seen it. Yeah, enjoy lunch there or something. So. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, I'll see, do uh, any folks have questions? Oh, Brian, go ahead, I see your hand up. Uh, thank you. Hey, Mike, um, just had a quick question uh, for the um, lights downtown. Is there any uh, partnership with or, or use of the downtown partnership funding, or is that 100% Parks and Rec? Yeah, it's it's essentially 100% Parks and Rec. I checked with our horticulture uh, director, and uh, it, it's essentially us. The one component I would have to be sure about is that we don't split the electricity, but I don't believe we do. I think, yeah, Brian, I think that the town square is 100% us. Parks and Rec. Okay. So. And I also wanted to just give a shout out to the Botanical Garden. My dad is a, a long time, 60 year landscape contractor and came up for Christmas 10 years ago and still talks about when we went there. He loved it. Okay. <laughs> good, good. We're glad he did. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, do other folks have questions? I'll jump in. Well, I actually have a bunch, but I'll, I'll keep it short. Uh, one, I was wondering if you guys, um, you know, as maybe many of us have have been switching over to LED lights, um, and I wonder if that's like, do you, I guess, how much of the city's inventory is still non-LED, and is that something you guys are looking at? I don't think we have any incandescent lights in the mix any longer. It's 100% okay. LED. Oh, great. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, because I know that certainly saves electricity. Yeah. <laughs> maybe if we did, it would be in a wreath or some old ornament or something, but it's all. Okay. <laughs> um, and then I wondered too, because I know um, this is again, you know, I, I try to get my lights up in October and then I probably take them down in March just because they're already frozen up on my house. So I just wondered, exactly. and because, you know, we have so many dark um, months in the year, I guess, when do you guys start taking them down or like how, how long do you leave them lit beyond Christmas? Basically? Yeah, so we typically we turn out the Christmas tree and the Christmas colors in Town Square, but then the remainder of the lights uh, light Town Square through, oh, I don't know, March or so. And it, it's usually late March when our staff gets out there and, and takes them down as well. And I think we extend the lifespan when we take them down on warm days and they'll break. And, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, no, it's, I, I appreciate having them on the light downtown, so. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Um, and then, and others feel free to jump in. I'll just keep running through. <laughs> um, I think my other question, it was more since you mentioned that greenhouse. So I saw um, on the capital or the bond request for next year, there's something about the greenhouse. And I just wanted to talk to you about that. It, it wasn't holidays. Uh, yeah, so I'll actually, actually take, yeah, I'll actually take that one. Um, so the assembly did add $350,000 um, on the bond for Parks and Rec for the replacement of the Russian Jack greenhouse roof. Um, at this time, the administration has identified that project already as a need, um, and we have current funding that we have identified for appropriations. So there's actually a document in front of the assembly right now for action on the 20th um, that includes $350,000 for that greenhouse roof. And so um, what we see is that we would utilize the funding we currently have um, to be able to replace that. And because we have it um, kind of in hand and of the availability to appropriate it right now, they would have um, the ability to start that project, um, you know, bidding it out potentially in, you know, January, February for a spring start to be able to do that kind of work instead of waiting um, and get, waiting for the bonds to get approved and then um, appropriate it after that. So um, that's that's kind of where that project is right now is that 
hopefully we can get that money appropriated right now um, and then get that project moving. Okay, that's great to hear. And I believe that's because um, I know there's there's the public greenhouse. That's the one you were describing, Mike. And then um, but there's also ones where you guys grow. So is that replacing the roof? Or is it both of those, or is it all one? It is that okay. that building, and I think I don't know if he has more than one, but okay. the Russian Jack one is is the big one. Is the yeah, essentially we have two non greenhouse buildings, okay. and then all the greenhouses, but um, it's the it's the non greenhouse buildings that need the okay yeah the roofing work. Okay, so, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, that makes me sure. Sure. Um, okay, I think I think those are actually my questions. Um, are there any other questions from folks on the on the line. Okay. Actually, I guess I do have one more. So, um, you know, because you mentioned this is a pretty um, seems pretty cost effective for the amount of, of work that it is. Is there um, is this something that over time you guys have had to scale back on? Because I know there's been you know over the years just cuts to the budget or you know trimming back. So I wondered, is this something where you had to scale back or is it pretty steady? To your knowledge, yeah, that's a great question. I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, I don't either. I mean, I've been here for years, um, yeah. and it feels been the same. Courtney, maybe I mean, I think, I think it all has been pretty status quo. I mean, we just have to work it in with our operating budget, right? Sure. And it's if we've got money, then we can do it. So. Well, thank you again for coming and um, and yeah, again for making the city beautiful. No, you're welcome. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> and we should have cross country ski trails uh, all over, given oh, recent yeah. events. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's time for the groomers to catch up, right? Uh, <laughs> and the grooming today. Yeah, nice. And the grooming today. So, thanks, you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Please take a cookie. Please take a cookie. Okay. Um, with that, so we are um, on to our uh, kind of last significant item. So the BAC member reports and discussion. And so um, that was really at first, sorry, for our department assignments. And this isn't, you know, um, a test or anything, but it's really just a chance for us to kind of go around and share um, a little bit about what we've learned from the departments. And I understand maybe not everybody has had a chance to do all of their meetings yet. Um, and so that's totally fine as well. Um, we've kind of left this on the agenda just as a reminder. And, an ongoing um, piece. So, uh, so I think what we were imagining for this is just everybody taking, you know, five minutes or so, um, share which departments we met with, and then if you have um, a takeaway or something surprising, or maybe even a, a specific budget item that folks have raised, um, that would be great to hear as well. Um, just to think to think about. So, um, so I don't know if we have a volunteer to go first. Um, I'm also happy to go first and model, but I do not need to. Do more talking, so so I'll see if anybody else wants to jump in. This is Lindsay. I can jump in. Um, I met this past week with. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Yep. Yeah. Go ahead. Yep. Okay. I met this past week with the mayor's office, the city attorney, and the municipal or the municipal attorney's office. And the municipal manager's office and had really great conversations with each. Um, my takeaway from the municipal attorney's office, I mean, I think that these are all, you know, pretty straightforward departments. You know, they're not huge with multiple layers. So they were pretty quick meetings. Uh, but my my takeaway from the municipal attorney's office is that, you know, they really have been impacted um, in terms of um, attrition once the state um, began offering higher wages and essentially, you know, they lost, I think that it's all, it's been well documented. I think we've talked about it uh, in this commission previously, but, you know, they lost several attorneys to the state of Alaska following that uh, salary increase. And so in response, the uh, municipal attorney's office was able to increase salaries to retain the talent that they had and to um, you know, attract new attorneys to fill those vacancies. Um, and so that's that's been that's been a they've had a positive response and I believe it's about a 20% increase. Um, the uh, municipal manager's office, you know, there we talked about this last year about the restructuring um, of the 
you know, city government. And now there's multiple departments reporting up through the municipal manager's office. Um, and, you know, uh, one thing that I if, keep thinking about in the at fall, in the recent days with the snow is the, um, as was mentioned, the, the staffing constraints on the, particularly the snow plows. And I think that, you know, when I spoke with Ms. Domboski, she mentioned that, you know, people might not notice it at, at the time because, you know, the shortage, because the plow drivers that they have are working weekends and going, you know, 10 days without a day off, um, to keep the streets maintained, but, you know, but at that point we hadn't had a heavy dump of snow. And so I think that, you know, people maybe are starting to notice that a bit and just understanding the, the staffing constraints that are experienced across the municipality and, and how hard the folks on the streets really are working to keep our roads maintained. Um, and I, I really appreciated that, that insight. Um, when I spoke with the uh, mayor's office yesterday, I believe it was Bryce, um, can't think of his last name right now, but, um, that was, that was really, um, you know, just a really straightforward budget. And it seems like, you know, of it's about a $2 million budget and about a quarter of it goes to community grants, uh, which I was not aware of about 600,000 of that. Um, so, and, um, yeah, that was pretty, that was pretty much it. Thanks, Lindsay. Mm -hmm. And I, I apologize, I don't have my notes in front of me because I'm uh, stuck at home today. <laughs> oh yeah, no, that's okay. This was just kind of informal, just what you what you thought might be interesting to share. Mm -hmm. um, who would like to go next? Well, I, I could say yeah, okay. really briefly that I, I, I haven't done my meetings yet, so I, I, I feel a lot of guilt about that and I'm Sorry, uh, I feel like I'm disappointed. Uh, no. um, so, but I have the planning department and Anchorage Community Development Authority. So I'm I'm, I'm really excited to, to talk to them, and I, I need the um, need to get those meetings done. And I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to to the to that. So I'm, I'll get that out of the way. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Dawn. And yeah, no shame. I know it's been busy, and certainly it's been busy for all the department heads as well. So I know it's hard to to schedule. Um, and I'll also say too, if you haven't had to had a chance to do all three, but you just want to share one, that's also um, an option. So I'll see if anybody else uh, was wanting to share. Yep, Carolyn, go ahead. Thanks. I uh, it's been a while, so I'm reviewing my notes right now to jog my memory. But I met with um, development services in early September, and I met with OMB with Courtney in very early September. So please forgive me as I kind of stumble through and refresh my memory with these notes here. Um, I'll start with OMB. Um, we went through all of like the super simple nuts nuts and bolts as far as what OMB does when it comes to the budget, but then also the management part of their responsibilities. That was pretty straightforward. Um, one topic that falls within um, those, uh, within the management and budget part is IGCs, <clears throat> excuse me, and IGCs are intergovernmental charges, <clears throat> excuse me. And those are kind of a, a mind warp and, and kind of gets complicated when it comes to the services that are internal services that the in, that the departments provide to one another and how they charge those departments for those services that they provide. So those departments may not be, um, you know, external facing necessarily, but they are still providing public services. However, they're internal to the general operations of municipal government. Um, so that was kind of, um, it's still kind of hard, hard for me to wrap my brain around sometimes, but it's, to me, it was really complicated and I'm sure Courtney could lap me multiple times on trying to, on, on explaining things, but um, it was really interesting. So internal departments are such as like HR and IT. Um, so those internal departments, um, and this is another factor as I'm reading my notes, internal departments don't charge other internal departments, but they are charging the external departments for the services that they're providing, kind of like for that local infrastructure. And Courtney, pl please feel free to um, correct me if I'm wrong on any of that. Um, You're doing great. <laughs> okay. Um, another interesting nugget was that OMB's 
budget 97% of it is labor, which when you think about it makes sense, of course. Um, one thing that I thought was really neat that Courtney is working on is the budget presentation award. So the Government Finance Officers Association created criteria as far as the best practices of how to best present the budget to the public. And it's basically a communication tool for the public. And OMB has received that distinction for 10 or 11 years now. Um, so it focuses on performance measures, how well are we doing with providing services or how well is OMB doing with providing services and municipal government providing services and then reviewing all of the performance value results, like looking into whether the performance value results are relevant um, in providing information to the public, um, are we measuring tasks that the public feels are important to them, what are the good measures, and are these measures that the public cares about. So I thought that was really pretty neat that there's um, that there is a budget presentation award um, associated with this um, Government Finance Officers Association um, that um, OMB has done such a good job over the last decade plus um, in sharing budget information with the public. I thought that was really, really neat and I appreciate that very, very much um, as a resident and as a BAC member. Um, Courtney, again, please correct me if I if I misspoke on any of that before I move on to development services. No, you did a very good job. Thank you. Good. I'm glad I took quite notes. Um, so again, in early September, I met with development services. I met with David Spees, Greg Sewell, and Stephanie Schaefer, and they were absolutely wonderful to speak with. We spent, I think, more than an hour um, talking about all the things that Development Services does, and I really had very, uh, like, a very limited understanding of what what they do. And they basically, their jobs are to provide services um, to pri private businesses, essentially. So. If somebody has a construction project that they want to do, they're working to make sure that um, they are able to help that private business conduct business um, in the municipality. There are nine divisions within development services, and that includes um, divisions such as addressing, private development, land use, code abatement, building inspection, right away, permits management, um, things of that nature. The, these divisions facilitate development, permitting, and oversight for construction, infrastructure and private development, code abatement, and land use enforcement, making sure that everybody um, conforms to zoning requirements. Um, there's also planning review, zoning review, follow-up inspections. Um, there's also um, uh, where, um, elevator and escalator inspections, when it comes to right away, that's for new water, sewer, driveways, utility poles, et cetera. Um, and basically in every, uh, in general, everything that's going to be done um, within the municipality um, when it comes to infrastructure needs to be approved. Um, let's see, they are responsible for 69 people in their department. Um, they have authorizations at the time on September 2nd, they had authorizations for 74 positions, which means that they had five positions open at the time. Um, let's see what else. Um, they at the time were having a major, um, they were saying that a major economic ripple effect as a result of the 5% cut is the sur surging fuel costs. And just like many other departments are, were, are and were experiencing is the surging fuel costs. Um, and they were explaining that they've been having a hard time with turnover in um, with permitting. So at the permit depart department, it sounds like um, there's such a high turnover that it's very difficult to get people trained up in a position to help with permit intake and then permit management. Um, so that's really been slowing down the permitting process and trying to make sure that those private developments are taking place um, in a timely fashion. And so because of that turnover and with those positions at the time not being filled, um, it sounds like there was a slowdown in services, um, unfortunately. Um, looks like my notes say that there were three takeaways. Um, so one of the reasons why they're having trouble with that high turnover is because the positions in particular are low paying jobs. 
Um, they're on the front lines of permitting. Everyone goes through the permit techs. Um, at the time, they were down three positions. Um, and it sounds like perhaps if they could be, it sounds like there, there may be some potential solutions to trying to, um, to make some improvements in that area. Um, they were also saying that it would be helpful for having additional code abatement officers and right away officers to help with their workload. Um, and of course, another priority, which I already briefed on, is um, the fuel um, charges and expenses just being what they were at that time. Um, so I think that's about it um, from the two departments that I've met with so far. I'm still waiting to meet with real estate, but my understanding is that there's been perhaps I, I think some challenges when it comes to scheduling a meeting there um, because of some some positions being moved around um, when it comes to um, real estate or I'm not sure if the director position has been filled yet, but I know that for a while I believe it was unfilled. So that is the end of my report. Happy to try to answer any questions um, should there be any, but I really enjoy the process and the exercise and um, I'm really appreciative for the opportunity. Yeah, thanks, Carolyn. And uh, no problem, Carmela. I just saw your note. Um, so thank you. OK, um, and I guess I'll see if there's anybody else who wanted to share um, reports, then I can get mine after that. Go ahead, Brian. Thank you. Um, I guess I'll start with the largest um, Largest department uh, being human resources. Um, it was very interesting to, to get together with them uh, and kind of get an understanding of the different facets. But of course, their staffing is about a little over 45. Um, that entails uh, the administration, benefits, employment, labor relations, and payroll. Um, you know, as far as their their expenses, their non personnel expenses. Their largest expense comes with contracts and software. Um, and uh, then it goes down to operating and supplies. The, they handle the parking reimbursements uh, for the employees, uh, their training, OIT billings. The, they do furniture, which kind of entails more of the ergonomic adjustments and then other miscellaneous items. Uh, as far as their initiatives, um, they are going through their uh, policy and procedures review, which apparently hasn't been done in decades. So I guess it's timely. Um, they are um, in need of, um, you know, more uh, in the software area that they are in implementing more in the NeoGov and the onboarding system to help speed up the process for new employees, which I think is timely because we've talked a couple of times, even in this meeting about the need for uh, recruitment and uh, employment uh, in the Muni. And it was in interesting to talk with them also because they are um, they are looking at themselves more as a being more competitive with the private sector. Uh, before it was always kind of like they would they were behind the private sector. Now they're trying to compete to take private sector jobs and bring them over to the municipality, which I thought was very interesting. Um, as far as their challenges, they are you know they they say they could use more staffing um i think that's kind of everybody's everybody's request um they're also uh said they could use some more money for training and professional development um that including professional certifications and recertifications uh they are getting to a point where a lot of the office furniture is very old and needs to be replaced um that including um the ergonomic accommodations that I talked about earlier. It's becoming more and more uh, prominent in with employees needing adjustments for their workstations. Um, they would like to see uh, more funding for team building and personnel development, personal development and training. And um, their IT equipment and training devices are also outdated. So I guess it's getting to the point where a lot of these things are um, getting past warranty life or, or will be so it's something to look for down the road, perhaps starting in the uh, 2024 budget. Um, so that's kind of what I had for human resources. The next uh, group that I met with was um, 
project management and engineering. It's a little bit different because their their uh, budget is more from uh, bonding, about 100% from bonding, and then so they're they don't have much in the uh, non personnel, if any uh, non personnel uh, expenses. They have a staff of five full time employees, um, which which increases to 26 to 27 that are fully bonded bonds funded for when they do their their projects for roads, sidewalks, trails, drainage projects and the CIP uh, that they they do every year. Um, for their uh, initiatives, they are um, they are looking at always updating or looking or moving towards updating the six year plan. Um, once it moves into the budget for uh, the current fiscal year, they're already starting to work on the next fiscal year. Um, they're also looking at uh, a decrease in total project costs. By improving the initial planning design, they are help. They're helping to decrease costs because by having a better initial planning, they don't have to incur higher costs by doing change orders. So I think that's going to kind of reap some some benefit uh, as far as uh, decreasing costs in the municipality. They're um, managing workman comp claims. They're by continuing monitoring risk management, um, and I believe. I may be wrong, but I believe they said they have not had a, a workman's comp claim in five years or over five years. Um, they are uh, evaluating any emergency issues that may need to be addressed and moved up the uh, CIP, um, you know, moved up the list as, as emergencies. They are working at traffic light replacements, especially in the downtown area. A lot of those he said are as, as old as 35 years old, uh, which was shocking and um, resurfacing roads, which I'm sure are going to get beat up with all the snow removal we're going to be seeing here uh, in the coming months. Um, some of the challenges in PM&E, um, the biggest one they said was uh, succession planning uh, as they are starting to look at uh, replacement of uh, employees who are getting to the point of retirement. It's not easy to replace, so I think that they're going to take a proactive approach to trying to find uh, replacements internally, if not look outside for those replacements. Um, they also talked about a, submit, a substantial decrease in state of Alaska funding for CIP. Um, one example he gave was from in the 2009-2010 period, the, the, the money that came to the Muni was between 50 and $75 million. And presently, it, they said it was about a million to two million. Um, and also the increase in construction supplies uh, due to inflation and the potential supply chain challenges that they may be facing. And then the final one that I um, I have and the smallest one uh, is uh, the Office of Equity and Justice. Um, right now it's uh, it's junior by himself, um, but he's uh, looking at um, they're recruiting for a replacement position. Um, he uh, He's been kind of it's obviously this is one of the, the newest uh, departments, um, so he's kind of getting his legs under him, but continually looking for outreach in the community um, to help with, um, you know, getting uh, disadvantaged and minority groups um, not only involved, but also um, extending a hand from the municipality. And so he's he's seeing some fruits from just the short period of time that he's been there. It's, I believe a little over a year. Um, he's continuing to work uh, with job fairs to extend um, to groups that normally may not know or understand that they are um, they have the opportunity to work for the municipality. Uh, he's increasing um, outreach to schools to help kids um, move, you know, kind of get uh, involved in, and understand um, their potential. He's also working with legal and HR. Um, they recently uh, changed the workforce policy to accept the non-traditional social and tribal experience as relevant for hiring for muni positions. This will help broaden the appeal of applicants who might otherwise not feel um, that they are qualified. So um, hopefully that will help with uh, some of the recruitment issues that the muni is also having. Um, one of the kind of the challenges is um, he's he's kind of going through and um, trying to reach out to 
some of the groups that have not um, been as responsive. Uh, you're starting to see some of them come back to the table. So they're kind of going in a circling back uh, to the groups that have, they've had success with, with, but also the groups they have not had success with. So in 2023, that's one of the initiatives that they are looking to take up. Um, they are also um, trying to bridge some of the gaps and continue to con uh, connecting with um, some groups that may not have been on their initial list, but uh, have kind of um, developed onto the list. Um, his challenges, um, he's, he said he could use some more staffing. Um, he, he specifically noted uh, perhaps an executive assistant that could help him with scheduling as well as more outreach. Um, and then um, he's also reaching out to other cities uh, in the country to see what's working for them. But they're also reaching out to him because they're hearing what's working up here. So I think this is a great um, department. It's it's uh, it's going to be great to see what um, they can continue to do um, and what they have done in the very short time that they have been a part of the Muni. I think that's about all I have. Those are the three departments that I met with. Um, if anybody has any questions. Okay, thanks, Brian. Thank you. And I'll just see if there's questions. Yeah, I think chat right now. Um, and then I'll just really briefly share, and then uh, maybe I know there, there's a, a, a few folks who haven't gone, so we'll, um, and, and a couple aren't here anyway, but are here for today's meeting. So we'll, um, we can circle back to that in January too. Um, so the departments I met with were, um, and I'll just be real brief, partly because I this was also back in September, so I, I would need to refer back to my notes. Um, but I met with the health department, um, so that was certainly the biggest department that I um, came in contact with. And uh, one notable thing about uh, that department, besides having so many different responsibilities, um, you know, everything from uh, public health to uh, running a clinic to, <laughs> to, of course, all the homelessness work, or most of it, uh, working with parks department is um, that they primarily run on grants. So they're kind of um, different than, than most or maybe all of their departments because um, they get a lot of money from the federal government through HUD and, and other sources, uh, some from the state. And so so that was interesting too. Um, and then of course, um, they have responsibility for most of the alcohol tax uh, funding, including the grants. And so um, so it's it's been a process kind of getting those uh, up to speed and figuring out, um, you know, not just receiving grant money, but also getting the grant money out the door. So that was a big theme of what we talked about there. Um, the next one I met with was uh, IT. And so um, that one, again, is a smaller department, but obviously, um, you know, s probably similar to HR, works with all the other departments. Um, so a couple of the things that um, Mark Dahl, the director, flagged there were um, well, one is just working across the different departments. I know his his goal has been to really centralize or at least coordinate more of the technology purchases. It sounds like in the past or traditionally it's been uh, a lot of departments kind of going it alone or, or um, you know, purchasing software or things that they need um, individually, but not um, not working across the board. So it's been a process to um, to involve IT folks uh, more directly and and um, maybe standardize some things there. He also mentioned um, kind of a, a budget challenge to be aware of is just, and this is a general trend across um, the IT industry is um, a lot of programs or, or uh, software companies are moving to subscription models. So as you know, in the past, it was uh, something that you would maybe buy a license for, but more likely you're just buying the product off the shelf. Um, and now a lot more places are doing annual or monthly subscriptions. I know in our office, we've certainly seen that with, um, you know, office, uh, Microsoft 365 and things like that. And so, um, so the budget implication is, um, you know, thinking about those things more as almost an operating cost or, or maybe not, it's just as a big capital purchase. So there's kind of, um, there's some big picture things I think that uh, need to get reconciled as that, that trend continues. Um, and then, let's see, I think that was IT. And then with uh, my third department was Merrill Field. So I got to go over and um, check out the airport. I'd actually never flown out of there. so. That was fun to see it for the first time and um, met with the new director uh, there, Rich Sewell, and um, and really got to learn a little bit more about the, the municipal airport, but also in general um, its role in 
um, basically being um, a landlord slash place of business for uh, private businesses that operate there. So, of course, aviation operators, um, support functions, things like that. So, um, so we, you know, we really talked about kind of areas where the airport would like to expand um, a lot, you know, it obviously would take um, capital funds and, and um, it was built on the old landfill, I guess. And so there's also just, um, you know, environmental slash um, geotechnical issues that, to work through if they want to use some of those lands, um, you know, even if they just look like flat land out there, there's things you have to do before you can build on it, but they have some projects going. And then, um, and then he also mentioned there, there is money um, through, well, the feds with FAA and then also working with the state um, Department of Transportation to access some some capital funding for projects. Um, and so um, I know that was something, um, it sounds like Mr. Um, uh, Newell had come from, from DOT and so he was familiar with those on the state side. So he had some ideas that he was planning to bring uh, to the administration as far as uh, new expansion projects. So that was uh, fun to learn about. And I think that's that's the summary for my end. So, um, so I see we just have a few more minutes. Um, and so why don't we move uh, quickly through our last topics? Um, and so again, thank you everybody for um, following up on those department assignments. And again, we'll uh, continue in January, and we can make time on the next agenda for some uh, additional sharing as well. So then uh, let's move to the 2023 schedule. Um, and Lila, so you have it up on the screen there. Um, so we have been meeting the second Thursday of the month, um, 1130 to 1 p.m. And so I see Lila has the schedule on the screen. And maybe you guys can remind me, is this something that we need to vote on or is it just informational? I think it's informational because okay. um, I think you guys have already voted that it'll be the second Thursday and this is just the actual dates presented. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, yeah, and so I think I don't see any obvious conflicts. I know sometimes the first of the month can be tricky with things like Labor Day, but we're looking pretty good. Um, and of course, we can always move the meeting if we need to um, or schedule an additional one. So please go ahead and put those on your calendar uh, for 2023, and I will send out the, the meeting schedule. Uh, next, we have audience participation. I don't think we have any audience, well, certainly not in the room, but um, I don't think we have anybody online. Nope, just us now. Um, and so open discussion, and, and I guess I'll also uh, blend that in with the meeting topics. Um, so one thing I want to share is um, it is my intent next month to step down as chair. Um, so I do want to remind remain a member on this body, um, but uh, Vice Chair Nolan and I were talking about, um, you know, what the schedule has been in terms of changing leadership on the on the BAC because certainly it's something we do regularly. And so I think in the past it's been August. Uh, the last time we changed was uh, uh, when Lindsay actually was the prior chair and I was the vice chair. I think that was in January or February of last year. And so um, so uh, so it's, anyway, it's my intent to um, to do that and just kind of um, change up the leadership. So so that's something we can take care of in the meeting. But I just wanted to let folks know um, if you're thinking about uh, wanting to step up and take a leadership role. Um, and so, uh, and so, and again, right now I am the chair, no one is the vice chair. And so um, we can, um, we can look at uh, electing or reelecting both positions at that point. And then um, in terms of topics, I guess I'll just uh, ask folks uh, thinking ahead to the future meetings, if there's topics that you would like to see on future agendas um, beyond, you know, the things that we always plan for, like the fall budget review. And one I'm going to throw on there is the uh, legislative priorities. I think that'd be useful to hear about both from the administration and the, um, I know there are questions from the school district. It sounds like they have their legislative priorities. It'd be great to, um, to hear both of those together. And I'll just see if any other folks have ideas for topics. Um, it can be something, you know, major or time sensitive, or it could be something like, like we did with the holiday lighting, just something you'd like to hear about. And I know it's also uh, at the end of the end of the year and a busy month. So, um, so I guess I'll I'll say too, if you think of any topics, please do share them with uh, with me and Nolan, and also with um, Lila and Courtney, and we can keep a running list and get those figured out. Or if you think of something that came out of one of your department meetings that you'd like to follow up on or, or share with the group, um, that would be helpful as well. And and then of course we can just build our build our agendas as we go month to month. 
Um, any other topics for discussion from BAC members? Go ahead, Carolyn. Thank you. I just I wanted to take the opportunity to express my appreciation and gratitude to Courtney with OMB and then also with um, David Spees, Greg Sewell and Stephanie Schaefer with Development Services for providing time and their very busy and hectic schedules to meet with me to discuss their departments and so that I could learn about them. I really appreciate their enthusiasm and their very clear dedication and um, love for the work that they do and the services that they provide our community. So um, thank you very much for letting me take a moment to express my gratitude for them. I do appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Carolyn. That's a great thought. And I would certainly echo that for all the folks that I met with. Um, yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, and I, I'd, I'd like to make sure to recognize um, Anna, um, Anna's role as chair and how helpful that has been and how and to um, recognize her hard work and, and thank you for that, for your service to BAC um, as, as you wrap up your time as chair. So thank you. So, um, yeah, and I will still be here as a member for sure. So I'll have even more questions. <laughs> um, okay, any other comments? I see we have one minute left. Okay, well, I will not uh, belabor this meeting. So um, thank you again, uh, folks, for attending today and, and sharing. Um, and then you can see our next meeting is January 12th. So uh, we won't see you again uh, this year, at least not in this context. Um, and so, uh, yeah, have a, have a happy holidays and a happy new year. And with that, I'll look for a motion and a second to adjourn. This is fine, I'll move to adjourn. Okay. I'll second. Okay. Uh, so, motion by uh, Brian, second by Nolan to adjourn. And I'm going to guess there's no objection, so we are adjourned. So, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.